Imagine being in a situation where the only way to honor God is to run. This happened to a man named Joseph, recorded in the book of Genesis, chapter 39. The background is that Joseph had been sold into slavery and brought to Egypt. He ended up in the household of Potiphar, a high-ranking officer under Pharaoh. God's favor fell on Joseph so that everything he touched thrived. Recognizing this, Potiphar entrusted Joseph with managing his entire household, which brought God's blessings to the master's house as well. Potiphar had so much faith in Joseph's abilities that he left everything under his care. Now, Joseph happened to be a good-looking guy, and Potiphar's wife started making sexual advances when the master wasn't around. Joseph repeatedly denied these advances and told her, Behold, because of me, my master has no concern about anything in the house, and he has put everything that he has in my charge. How then can I do this great wickedness and sin against God? The advances continued, increasing with frequency and intensity, and yet Joseph continued to resist the temptation to sleep with his master's wife, not just because it was an offense against Potiphar, but mainly because it was an offense against God. But then one day, she grabbed him, begged him to sleep with her, pulling off his clothes. This is where Joseph knew his only option to honor God was to run. Unfortunately, he left his outer garment in her hand. And she used that to twist the story around, stating that Joseph was the one making sexual advances. And difficult repercussions followed, but Joseph had remained faithful to God. In situations like these, running from temptation isn't just an act of fear or weakness. It's a powerful choice to maintain one's integrity, but more importantly, to stay faithful to God. Oh, and spoiler, the Genesis account reveals that God continued to care for Joseph and bless him throughout his entire life. Welcome to Mountain View Church. My name is Jeremy. Over the past six weeks, we've been exploring the battle, the battle of temptation and how to master it. We're in the final week of unpacking six strategies based on scriptural principles. Each strategy is part of an acrostic, M-A-S-T-E-R, designed to help us remember how to tackle temptation in our daily lives. Before we continue with today's message, I'd like to invite you to connect with us. You can click the Connect tab at mountainview.church or text connect to the number on the screen. For those listening on the radio or podcast, that number is 867 877- 322-8001. If you're here in-house, you'll find a Connect card under the seats in front of you. Once you fill that out, hand it in to the welcome desk, and someone will connect with you. For those of you with children, we offer a full program called Base Camp every Sunday morning, available both in-house and online. To access this week's lesson and activities, visit mountainview.church children or text children to the same number on the screen. And lastly, for our students, We have a youth program every Sunday evening from 6 to 8 p.m. You can learn more by visiting mountainview.church slash youth or texting youth to 867-322-8001. Now let's jump back into our content and our final lesson on the battle of temptation. Now I want you to remember this. Temptation is not a sin. You can be tempted, but that's not a sin. Satan does the tempting. God never tempts anybody. All of us are tempted. The Bible says that Jesus was tempted in every point. You say, do you think that Jesus was tempted along this line? The Bible says he was tempted in every point, like as we are, yet without sin. He showed us how it's possible to resist these temptations. Now, when temptation comes, don't get discouraged and say, well, I've already failed. No, you haven't. The temptation itself is not the sin. The thing that is the sin is when you yield to the temptation. Hi, my name is Jude, and I'll be reading from 2 Timothy 2, 20 to 26. Now in a great house, there are not only vessels of gold and silver, but also of wood and clay, some for honorable use, some for dishonorable. Therefore, if anyone cleanses himself from what is dishonorable, he will be a vessel for honorable use, set apart as holy, 
useful to the master of the house, ready for every good work. So flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. Have nothing to do with foolish, ignorant controversies. You know that they breed quarrels, and the Lord's servant must not be quarrelsome, but kind to everyone, able to teach patiently, enduring evil, correcting his opponents with gentleness. God may perhaps grant them repentance, leading to a knowledge of the truth, and they may come to their senses and escape from the snare of the devil, after being captured by him to do his will. Over the past weeks, we've learned how to master temptation using five strategies, and today we move on to the sixth. We started by monitoring our influences, identifying what or who pulls us away from God's path. Then we looked at accounting for our struggles, sharing and discussing our temptation with mature believers for support, followed by strengthening our spirits, engaging in spiritual disciplines to build resilience, which led us into training our minds, focusing on scriptural study to transform our thoughts as a defense against temptation. Then last week, establishing boundaries, drawing lines and relationships to protect ourselves from temptation. And today, we're running from temptation. When all else fails, we flee from situations that endanger our spiritual health. By weaving these strategies together, we've created a comprehensive defense against temptation. Each strategy supports the other. Certain strategies may work better for some than others, but the last strategy is a universal. It's as universal as temptation itself. No matter where you are in your spiritual journey, Running from temptation is a strategic move in the fight for your soul. If your house was on fire, you'd run to save your life, even though you care deeply about your home. The act of running may be connected to fear, but it's also connected to wisdom, recognizing the need to protect ourselves from harm. Sometimes the wise decision is to run. It's important to note that temptation comes in many forms. It can present itself through desires, pride, peer pressure, or other influences. It's persistent, but often subtle. It can catch us off guard. Knowing when to run versus when to stand firm is crucial in our spiritual battle. Running from temptation is the outcome of discerning that that situation is too overwhelming or too dangerous. It requires an immediate departure from that situation. That being said, sometimes it's nuanced. For example, if you're in a situation where gossip or negativity is rampant, it might be wise to remove yourself before you get drawn into that conversation. Although you're not actually running, you're running from that situation in your mind, in your heart. You're making a quick exit. In biblical terms, you're fleeing a potentially sinful outcome. In 2 Timothy 2, Paul advises Timothy to flee youthful passions and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace, along with those who call on the Lord from a pure heart. This dual instruction isn't just about avoiding specific sins. It's about steering clear of behaviors and desires that can distract us from our spiritual growth. Perhaps you're wondering, what are youthful passions? That's not a word we use often. In our modern context, we might jump to sexual desires, which is part of it. But from a New Testament perspective, youthful passions would have encompassed a variety of impulses, such as impatience, arrogance, rashness, excessive ambition, and of course, as we talked about, lust. Based on the content of both of Paul's letters to Timothy, many scholars believe that Timothy was in fact youthful, that he was a young man. And yet, according to Paul, age and lack of life experience aren't valid excuses. This is perhaps because youthful passions are temptations that can challenge anyone at any stage of life. That being said, by recognizing these tendencies in our daily lives, we better understand when we need to flee and seek God's strength. Think of it like a magnet. It both repels and attracts, depending on the orientation. In the same way, when we flee from temptation, we push away sin and draw closer to God. This dual action isn't just about running away from something bad, it's also about moving towards something good, something really good. As Paul stated to Timothy, the good is righteousness, faith, love, and peace centered on Christ. 
Pursuing these virtues not only helps us resist temptation, but also transforms our character. We become more like Christ. By taking the deliberate step to flee temptation, we make a powerful choice to protect our spiritual integrity. The decision to flee is an active one, a choice to prioritize our relationship with God above anything else. And the Holy Spirit plays a critical role in this whole process. He guides us internally through conviction and providing the strength to flee, to run when it's necessary. That considered, it's essential to remain sensitive to the Holy Spirit's leading through prayer, meditation, sensitivity, being aware of His presence, ever ready for that prompting to run. Let's come back to that example of gossip. Imagine there's a woman who has struggled with the temptation of talking negatively about others at her workplace. It's been a problem in the past. And yet over time, she's realized that remaining in those conversations was damaging to her spirit and her witness. Now, When a conversation arises that is trending toward the negative, she quietly and prayerfully moves on to another task. Her physical movements are subtle, but her spirit is fleeing the temptation. By choosing to step away and seek God's wisdom through prayer, the woman has not only avoided the sin, but she's also become a light to her co-workers. She's demonstrating the push and pull of that spiritual magnet. Her flight from temptation has moved her toward the righteousness, faith, love, and peace that come from following Christ. This, of course, is just one small example, and maybe you don't struggle in that area, but there are hundreds, if not thousands, of situations where you and I are faced with decisions to run, to flee, or to stay. And a lot of times, the running is the best choice. We choose to run before temptation takes root and leads us astray. We need to remain vigilant in our walk, always seeking God's wisdom to know when to stand firm and when to flee those youthful desires, ultimately so that we can live lives that honor Him, that honor Jesus. All right, let's take a deep dive into some application. I'd like to break down seven areas of temptation that would fit into the modern time youthful desires. Then I'll give the biblical defense on why running from that desire is the best idea. Guaranteed that at least one of these seven will resonate with you. Let's get started. First, impulsiveness. In our fast-paced world, it's easy to make decisions based on fleeting emotions and desires without considering the long-term consequences. And yet, in Proverbs 21, we're instructed that the plans of the diligent lead surely to abundance, but everyone who is hasty comes only to poverty. When faced with decisions, especially moments of temptation, it's crucial to pause, think, and pray. Reflect on whether you're about to make a quick decision that you would later regret. Back away, leave the temptation, and assess the outcome. Let's move on to our second youthful desire, pride and ego. Modern culture often glorifies seeking attention and recognition, but biblical instruction constantly warns us against the dangers of pride. In Proverbs 16, we read, pride goes before destruction and a haughty spirit before a fall. Practicing humility is key, remembering that our true worth comes from God and not from human praise. We should reflect on any area of our lives where pride might be leading us to make an unwise choice, then instead run toward the humble option. All right, third, the third youthful desire is sexual temptations. The pressure to engage in unhealthy and self-destructive sexual behaviors is rampant in our modern culture. Paul, writing to the Corinthian church, warned them plainly to flee from sexual immorality. To safeguard yourself, it is essential to run from situations, people, or media that provoke this temptation. Aggressively set up accountability software and partnerships. Protect your purity at all costs. And if you've already lost it, that's okay. You can get serious about allowing Christ to bring it back. Now, fourth, materialism and greed. The desire to accumulate wealth and possessions is also pervasive in modern society. Paul, writing to his young apprentice, warned him that the love of money is a root of all kinds of evil. 
It is through this craving that some have wandered away from the faith. Depending on your level of temptation, cultivating contentment might require you to sell your possessions and give away the money that you're clinging to. In a sense, God might be calling you to run away from your wealth, to heal the constant yearning for more. Fifth, peer pressure and conformity. It's common to feel the pressure to conform to societal trends or the opinions of the populace. This warning is a throwback to last week where Paul calls the Romans to not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renewal of your mind, that by testing you may discern what is the will of God, what is good and acceptable and perfect. Standing firm in your beliefs and seeking God's will may cost you relationships. It's harsh, but it's true. You may have to run from being accepted by your peers so that you don't conform to a morality or an ideology that's opposed to scriptural principle, that's opposed to God's will. Number six, the sixth youthful desire is neglecting responsibilities. Focusing too much on personal enjoyment can lead to neglecting important responsibilities for your family, your work, and your community. Paul, once again writing to his apprentice Timothy, instructed him that if anyone does not provide for his relatives, and especially for members of his household, he has denied the faith and is worse than an unbeliever. It's important to prioritize your responsibilities and be faithful to your roles. Sometimes we have to run away from the things we want in order to care for those who depend on us. It might mean fleeing self-centered fun, relaxation, recreation, or pleasure so that you can sprint toward serving others. The final youthful desire of our modern time is addictive behavior. Modern life is full of activities and substances that can lead to addiction, from travel experiences to technology overuse and substance abuse to unhealthy eating habits. There's a lot. Paul, writing to the Corinthian Christians, called them to follow his example, that all things are lawful for me, but not all things are helpful. All things are lawful for me, but I will not be dominated by anything. It's crucial to evaluate your behaviors and cut off those behaviors that have become controlling or harmful in your life. Run to every helpful resource you can find. Addictive behaviors are a toxin that needs a regimen of antidotes that come in physical, mental, emotional, and of course, spiritual forms. You can flee addiction by clinging to the help that's provided. Truly, if you're currently battling an addiction, please don't wait. Start running today. This video can even wait. Call a friend right now and ask for their help to find a recovery center for your struggle. Get help right now. Please don't wait. Remember, fleeing isn't just a physical act. It's a spiritual discipline that prevents sin from taking root in our hearts. It calls us to recognize the signs of temptation and take proactive steps to stop it, avoid it, and run from it, ultimately seeking God's strength through prayer, the scriptures, and a local church community. As we lean on the Holy Spirit, we gain the discernment needed to know when to flee. The hard truth is that running from temptation doesn't feel natural, but it's an act of wisdom and strength. Remember Joseph from our introduction. Natural desire would be to give in to sexual advances, and yet, Joseph ran. In doing so, he didn't merely resist the sinful act. He fled the entire environment where the sin could have occurred. He wasn't just avoiding a poor decision. He was proactively safeguarding his relationship with God. As we close, let's take a 30,000 foot perspective of this entire series. Each of these six strategies that we've discussed in the series are interconnected. They form a comprehensive and integrated defense against temptation. Running from temptation becomes more effective when we've established boundaries that prevent us from entering compromising situations in the first place. We're more inclined to flee when our spirits are strengthened through spiritual disciplines. Monitoring the nouns, those influences, help us recognize that we're veering toward danger, while training our minds equips us to focus on what is pure and right, making it easier to resist temptation and accounting for our struggles by sharing them with a trusted, mature believer provides the support we need to stay strong and to come full circle gives us the courage to run. 
As we conclude this series, reflect on how each strategy can strengthen your defense against temptation. Ask yourself, where do I need to set more boundaries? Where do I need to seek more accountability? Are there areas where I need to take swift action and run? When and how do I need to flee? Commit to integrating these strategies into your daily walk with Christ. The journey isn't over, but by applying these principles with dedication, you can overcome temptation. When faced with temptation, don't stand and fight. Flee and pursue righteousness, faith, love, and peace. All those things that Paul highlighted to Timothy. Reflect on what we've discussed over the past weeks and identify the areas of growth. Commit to taking these steps seriously. And I assure you that applying them into your daily life will be worth it. It's only fitting to end this series with communion. I'd invite you to prepare your hearts to take communion with us. Let's take some time and reflect on Jesus' sacrifice, which empowers us to live righteously. Ultimately, it's Christ who calls us to run from temptation. We're not running alone. Christ is with us, guiding our steps toward God's purpose and provision. Christ is with you. Let's pray together and then pause the video to gather the elements and then we'll prepare to take communion. Will you pray with me? Dear Heavenly Father, thank you for your word and the wisdom it provides. Strengthen us to flee from temptation and pursue your righteousness. Pursue your faith, love, and peace. As we approach communion, help us remember your son's sacrifice with gratitude. Prepare our hearts to receive the bread and cup, the symbols of his body and blood. We ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Today we'll be using the communion account written by the Apostle Paul, found in 1 Corinthians chapter 11, verses 23 to 26. I'll start by giving thanks for the bread, reading the coinciding passage, and then we'll take the bread together. Then I'll repeat those same steps for the cup. Let's give thanks for the bread. Dear Father, we approach you again and thank you for the bread which represents your son's body. Jesus, we thank you for willingly going to the cross for us, for taking our punishment, even though you were perfect and deserved none of it. As we take this bread, we think of you on the cross, and we offer our thanks, we offer our remembrance, and we commit ourselves once again to follow you as Lord and King. In Jesus' name, amen. For I received from the Lord what I also delivered to you, that the Lord Jesus, on the night when he was betrayed, took bread. And when he had given thanks, he broke it and said, This is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. Now let's give thanks for the cup. Dear Father, we thank you again for the cup representing the blood of your Son, Jesus. We know from your scriptures that there can be no atonement without the spilling of blood. And you chose as a gift to send your Son to us to be the final sacrifice, the final atonement. Jesus, we choose to see you on the cross in our mind's eye and the blood running down your body. We understand that it points to our redemption. The atoning blood that washes us clean of our sin. We thank you again, Jesus. In your name we pray. Amen. Paul continued, In the same way he also took the cup after supper, saying, This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. 
For as often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, you proclaim the Lord's death until he comes. Thank you so much for sharing this time of communion with us, and thank you for journeying with us through this entire teaching series. Before we conclude our service, please stick around for this week's updates, followed by our discussion and prayer focus. Hey Mountain View, the next Young Adults event is this Friday, September 13th at 7 p.m. We're having a backyard fire and worship night, so bring an instrument if you want. We're gonna have s'mores, bring a friend, the address is 85B, 11th Ave East, and it's happening at 7 p.m. Can't wait to see you there. Hey, Mountain View. It's almost fall and community groups are starting up, and I want to introduce you to Aaron Geary, who will be facilitating men's groups starting this week. Now, this is the first of our fall community groups to roll out, and if you're interested in men's group, this is the guy to find on Sunday morning and chat with. Aaron, what can a guy expect when he shows up at 5.30 on Tuesdays? Good morning. Yes, you can expect food, you can expect fellowship, and you can expect prayer. Perfect. And this is a planned study, so how long will this particular study run for? This study will run for six weeks, and it'll start at 5.30 p.m. on Tuesdays. Okay, and I believe he's going to get into the book of First John. So if you've always wanted to know about First John, this is the way to go. There you have it, folks, starting Tuesday, September 10th at Mountain View. Just head downstairs for 5.30 p.m. and follow the smell of pizza. Thank you very much. Mountain View Church is part of a network of over 500 churches across Canada, coast to coast, known as Fellowship National, under the banner of the Fellowship of Evangelical Baptist Churches of Canada. Next week, we're honored to host our Fellowship National President, Steve Jones, and Board Chair, Doug Blair here with us in Whitehorse in the Yukon. We'll hear what's going on within our movement across our nation and what's in store for our fellowship in the future. Please note that this special Sunday will not be filmed, so there will not be an online gathering like we're watching now. We invite you to join us in-house only at 9.30 a.m., 11 a.m., or 3 p.m. Next, we are just two weeks away from the You Belong Women's Conference. If you're a woman, this is an incredible opportunity for you to gather, grow, and be encouraged in your faith. Tickets are selling quickly, so make sure to secure yours before they run out. You can get more information and purchase tickets by visiting mountainview.church conferences. As is our practice here at Mountain View, we always end with some discussion time to apply what we've learned. Gather together or drop a comment in the feed answering this question. What are the youthful passions that often tempt you, and what's your plan to flee from them? Again, what are the youthful passions that often tempt you, and what's your plan to flee from them? After your discussion, take a few moments to pray with each other. Focus your prayer on this request. Pray for the wisdom to recognize temptations and the courage to flee when necessary. Again, pray for the wisdom to recognize temptations and the courage to flee, to run, when necessary. Thank you again for taking the time to watch or listen. Please fill out that Connect card if you're in-house or go to mountainview.church connect if you're online. And we would love to get to know you more.